In this interview, I speak with Don and David, who each spent decades researching all the things we've been lied about, including the monetary system, legal system, evolution, and the primary focus of this conversation, germ theory. Viruses do not cause disease. And if you want to understand why this statement is evidently true, the next hour and a half will be of immense value to you. Hey everyone, so today I'm joined by Don and David, authors of What Really Makes You Ill, Why Everything You Thought You Knew About Disease Is Wrong. And so for anyone who still believes this narrative that I can cough out a virus that makes someone else sick or, you know, that taking an antibiotic will do anything besides worsen health, um, this video is definitely for you. So um, Don and David, thank you both so much for joining me today. Well, thank you for inviting us. Yeah, yeah it's great to talk to you. Yeah, thank you, Joey. Pleasure to be here. So, um, you know, for people who are, who don't really know or, you know, are unfamiliar with this whole topic, germ theory is basically the belief that diseases are caused by the invasion of the body by microorganisms. So when it comes to like so-called pandemics, like influenza or what's happened in the last couple of years, um, these microorganisms allegedly move from one human to the next. So can let's just get right into it. Like, can you talk about some evidence that viruses are unable to actually spread and cause disease? Yeah, sure. I mean, the first thing, um, because it's very common, uh, particularly by the medical establishment, to refer to bacteria and viruses as microorganisms. And that's the first mistake, of course. I mean, <laughs> because that sort of gives people the impression that viruses are living things, whereas they're not, and we'll we'll get into that. Bacteria ba are bacteria they're certainly are alive. Yes, they definitely. are living things. But to mix the two together gives people a false impression right from the get go, as it were. So what our research over ten years was was to start right back with the germ theory to find out just what these are these, and uh, if there's any actually any scientific evidence to prove that they do cause diseases. And the short answer is, no, they don't, which is obviously <laughs> very surprising to people and why the subtitle of our book is Why Everything You Thought You Knew About Disease Is Wrong. Because, uh, well, going back 15 years, that's where we were. We thought germs made you ill, vaccinations were good, and all of that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So uh, we found out that uh, none of those things were true. So um, what we found with... Uh, these things called viruses, which are actually, as we discovered, are just cellular debris, so that when uh, cells or tissue breaks down in the body, which it does every day, um, that's what they actually see when they look at these particles under an electron microscope, which had just come up as specks and things like that. And going right back about 100 years, uh, they only had optical microscopes, so they could only see bacteria. And it wasn't until the 1930s, when they had the invention of the electron microscope, that they could see smaller things. But the process that's gone through to be able to put something under an electron microscope is quite detrimental to whatever it is you've sampled. So it's certainly always dead, whatever it is, because it's bombarded by high energy electrical fields for a start. But it's also any samples are treated with chemicals that are sort of heated and colored and dyed. All sorts of things happen to them. So really, the samples that they put under an electron microscope bear no resemblance to what it was you took out of a human body. So that's where the problems start. And <clears throat> further research showed us that the whole field of virology, um, which is to examine uh, viruses, um, their methodology of taking a sample and then examining it in a Petri dish uh, proved to be totally unscientific. Uh, I mean, I can go through basically what they do very short, uh, very quickly, if you'd like me to do that. Sure. Yeah. So if, <clears throat> let's say, uh, they take a sample from a, a supposedly sick person, a blood sample or a tissue sample, um, <clears throat> and then put it in a Petri dish in a laboratory. 
Um, now, they're only at this stage supposing, and it's important to realize that, they're only supposing that there is a virus in that sample. They don't know. They're supposing. But then what they do is they add antibiotics, um, uh, serum, a uh, blood serum uh, from a baby calf, uh, monkey kidney cells, and various other chemicals. And then they call that an isolation. So mm. this, again, is where it deceives the public, because as anyone can see, that's not isolating anything. That's making a cocktail. You know, we understand as normal human beings that when you isolate something, you separate it from everything else. But not so in virology. They make up this concoction of all these chemicals and things that I've just mentioned. And then they leave it in the Petri dish for about up to five days. And when they come back, of course, uh, they see that all the cells are dead in the uh, cough blood and the monkey kidney cells. Mm -hmm. Everything is dead. And so they assume that it was a virus that was in the dish that has killed everything. Again, just an assumption. So many people, doctors, including ourselves, have complained that that's not scientific. And why are you, Mr. Virologist, not doing a control experiment, which they've never done? ever in the last 70 years that they've been carrying out those sorts of experiments. So another virologist that we know, uh, that you may have heard of, a Dr. Stefan Lanker, a German uh, virologist, <clears throat> well, he was trained as a virologist, uh, he'd also bitterly complained that this, what they were doing is totally unscientific and doesn't prove anything. So he said, well, I'll do the control experiment. Obviously, he's a qualified uh, as a virologist mm -hmm. so what he did was then take a second petri dish so he so he'd now got two petri dishes the first one he did exactly what they did took a sample from a sick person mixed all those different things antibiotics and all the rest of it in one dish in the second dish he put all the same concoction except nothing that could be construed as viral material Okay. Then left them. Then left them for the same number of days, up to five days. When he came back, all the cells were dead in both dishes. So that proved that <laughs> all the cells will die, no matter what. I mean, and they die because for two reasons. One is they've been poisoned by the chemicals and antibiotics that's been put into the dish, and two is that they've been starved to death because they've just been left without food for because cells need food. Uh, they've been left without food for five days. So quite a standard, simple experiment. And it shows that all what virologists do is unscientific and has no basis in science at all and does not prove anything. Um, hence, they've never been able to prove that a so-called particle, which they call it cause, calling a virus, is actually a pathogen. And because one is it's not alive, it's just cellular debris. Mm -hmm. And two is there's nothing that has been able to show that it can infect someone and pass pass on a disease, enter someone's body, enter a cell and multiply. And they've never been able to prove that ever um, over the last, well, the last uh, 100 years or one of the great experiments they did was in the uh, 1918 flu epidemic. Right, right. Where they tried, so cool, yeah. they tried desperately to infect healthy people by taking, it was quite disgusting really, taking nasal extracts from sick people, taking blood samples from sick people, having sick people cough directly into the faces of healthy people. And they, they did this dozens and dozens of times. And never once were they able to infect a healthy person so i mean the the medical establishments have disproved their idea of infection stroke contagion themselves i mean there's been a lot that's been done many, done many times so I, I mean i'm just giving you a short a short description really but you can see from the experiments they've done them themselves you can see from the unscientific nature of the virology experiments with their petri dishes that there's no science basis for this claim that uh, these particles, cellular debris, uh, are pathogens, i.e. that they cause harm. Hmm. So that was the start of it, really. And, and we found that we found the same for bacteria, of course, even though they are living things. But uh, again, 
There is no scientific papers that prove that any bacteria causes any disease. So this set us on the path of trying to find out, well, what does make you ill? Hence the first part of the title of the book, What Really Makes You Ill? And uh, that's really, really a very straightforward and natural process where we, we found, cutting a long story short, we found that um, the majority of illnesses that before mankind all boil down to four factors, which we call our four factors. And that is um, lack of proper nutrition. So the body's not getting the right food to um, keep it healthy. Um, overexposure to toxic materials, which can be um, a whole wide variety. A whole variety. Mm. We, do, we list quite a lot of them in the book. You know, it can be for anything from household products to uh, processed food to contaminated water you know because even what comes out of our taps is not uh, pure water there's chlorine and fluoride in it and many other things um even what you wash your clothes in uh, yeah. personal body care lots of different sources chemtrails lots of different sources of toxins then the third factor was emfs electromagnetic frequencies as we know we're all exposed to them every electrical device um, emits an electrical field which <clears throat> can interrupt and disturb the body's own electrical field because the body is has an electrical system as well as a chemical system um, hence how the heart works and the brain it's all nerve impulses are, are electrical in nature um, so that that can be disrupted by strong outside electrical fields and then last but not least is a uh, prolonged stress um, we found that stress can be detrimental not only physiologically but also psychologically so those four factors uh, one or more of them we always found were responsible for all of the different illnesses that uh, we mentioned in the book which is most of the ones that people would will be most familiar with okay so that that's a, a short <laughs> description a brief overview, a brief, yeah. a brief overview of why the germ theory is a big problem, you know, because it's never been proven to be the cause of disease. Right. Right. Absolutely. Um, and this is exactly what I've uncovered. I don't know if you, you are familiar with Aldrinus Wunderplanets, but um, you, you are Don. He he talked yeah. about a lot, a lot about uh, germ theory being wrong. And I got a lot of ideas from him. Um so okay, so you you talked about viruses, but and how they're not living. Um, obviously, they don't have a, a respiratory system, and they don't actually have a cell functioning metabolism. Then, then, um, but how about bacteria? You mentioned it briefly, but um, I think uh, who was the doctor? Uh, K uh, O C H or who said oh, the bacteria? Oh, uh, Koch, doctor, oh, the German, Koch. yeah, yeah, yeah okay. the microbiologist, yeah. Koch, yeah. Right. Yeah. He said that bacteria is a cause of some diseases. Then we're told that bacteria causes strep throat, uh, whooping cough, tuberculosis and other things. Um, and this is another component of the germ theory. How do you know that that is also incorrect, along with the whole concept of viruses being transmissible and um, causing disease being correct, incorrect as well? Well, the thing with bacteria is that uh, they are um, found in people who got diseases but not always the case i mean the the first of uh, what are called cox postulates says that the causal agent or the microbe whatever uh, should be found in everyone who has the disease it's supposed to cause and should never be found in people who don't have the disease and if it does cause something then that that should be followed that should be the case because if something if x causes y then you know x should always be there in the presence of of the whatever the phenomenon y is um mm -hmm. but that's not the case i mean there is plenty of inf um, plenty of evidence um you know when you really start looking into papers and um the original writings of various people it's you know the things get changed over the years but when you find the original writings you discover that um there are plenty of people who have said that certain of these certain bacteria that's supposed to be there aren't found on people who have the disease it's supposed to cause so i think some of the examples we cite are, are diphtheria and tuberculosis so if the 
um, bacterium that is supposed to cause tuberculosis is not there in a person with tuberculosis or with a diagnosis of tuberculosis it cannot be the cause um, mm. because it would have to be there and so because there are these exceptions it raises the question well they cannot be the cause that they may they may be contributory that's a possibility but that's still a hypothesis that's never been proven and what they have done uh, in the past is they have actually had pure cultures of bacteria and introduced them into the bodies of, of healthy people and nothing's happened and these people have not been ill now if they are causal agents they should always make people ill when those agents are introduced into a healthy person and that isn't the case so it, it's um, it's based on a lot of um, misinformation, but also habits. You know, we we have that kind of, oh, don't sneeze over me. You know, I don't want your germs. So we've just brought up with that idea that they do without ever really asking the question, do they? Well, where's the evidence? And that's really what's going on at the moment, that people are saying, well, actually, let's have a look at this properly. Let's you know investigate let's ask questions you know um and um obviously scientists don't like that it's not it's not that you know they are you know deliberately lying or anything like that it's not that at all but it's because they've been trained in following these procedures and they are told that this this means you know this particular um something that that phenomenon they are seeing should be interpreted in this way you know so if if this happens so again in as david said with the you know petri dish um when when the when you see what are called these cytopathic effects you know these cells die break down and you see these little round particles these little circles like oh well that's the virus well um they aren't because first of all the in order to actually see um that sample under electron microscope one of the things that has to be done is they have to be sliced really really thinly so that's not even a a whole piece of of tissue it's just a thin slice and so it's just it's just a circle i mean there's just no proof that they're anything so to to say you know they don't they don't have um any kind of um features or or um any kind of attributes you know whether they've got respiratory you know it, that's never been seen because these part whole particles have never been sort of seen isolated completely so they can be really analyzed and characterized um, but as i say bacteria are but the but again plenty of uh, experiments were done as i say for pure cultures of bacteria being put into healthy people with absolutely nothing happening to those healthy people at all and also what we have to realise is that uh, bacteria are a natural part of mm. the human body. We've all got them both in our bodies and on our bodies. They're part of, as we've seen in our research, they're part of uh, the cleanup system in the body. They are there to actually dispose of what we mentioned earlier, cellular debris, because cells break down all the time in the hundreds of thousands every day. So something has to clean up that debris so that it can be eliminated from the body. And that's what the bacteria in, in our bodies does. Uh, wouldn't even be able to digest our food if we hadn't got hundreds of thousands of bacteria in our gut. They're breaking our food down. They produce hydrogen, which is reabsorbed into the body. All essential things. So without bacteria in and on our body, we wouldn't be alive. And we see it out in the forest don't we bacteria breaking down dead trees and things and, and returning it back to the earth so they're a natural part of life they're not life's enemy and they're certainly not human's enemy you know yeah i to kill them is really the wrong way to go right i remember how happy i was when i put all the pieces together because everything started to really make sense. Like I looked into animals in nature and saw that they were not afraid of bacteria. Dogs are sniffing each other's butts and it, everything just really starts to make sense. And like you mentioned, the bacteria are decomposing things. We learned this, you know, when we were 10 years old, looking, going in, out into the gardens and, and at least I did when I was in school. So everything did start to make sense. And I guess the logical extension of what you're saying with bacteria not actually being at the root of disease is that antibiotics are completely counterintuitive. And that's what you actually discussed in the book. So 
what do antibiotics actually do that's that's uh, so harmful for us? Okay, well, as the name implies, of course, antibiotics means anti-life. So they are designed to kill and they're designed to kill bacteria. And as we've just said, bacteria are essential. So you don't really, first off, don't want to be taking something that's going to kill them because that inhibits the body from repairing itself and keeping itself healthy. So that's the first thing. And because antibiotics are seen by the body as a toxin, so the body treats it in exactly the same way as it does any toxin. So several things happen. One is trying to get rid of the antibiotic because it's a toxin. Um, it will often uh, fire up the endocrine system into overdrive, which can then exhaust the endocrine system. And that's why repeated use of antibiotics is even doctors are realizing that's not to be recommended because eventually the endocrine system doesn't work properly. So mm -hmm. that's the first thing. But also there's evidence to show that uh, it actually the toxin inhibits the body from trying to get rid of some of the toxins. So the body will then have to suppress its, it, the, the antibiotics suppress the body's um, mechanisms. And so the body ends up not being able to get rid of all the toxins. So it, it for, they're forced back into the body in simple terms, even to the point of uh, the body will encapsulate those toxins that it can't get rid of and forms what the medical establishment call a tumour, which they will then classify as a cancer, probably, and then want to give you chemotherapy or radiotherapy to break down that tumour. And as we know, both of those methods are extremely toxic. And uh, by their own admission, the chemotherapy drugs are extremely poisonous. Uh, but in their mind, they seek and think that they can kill the tumour kill the cancer before they kill you <laughs> that's basically it but uh, for the vast majority of cases and i know this from personal experience with family and friends they just end up killing the patient it yeah. might take them two years but they end up killing the patient but then of course they just say that they've died of cancer but uh, no they've died of the treatment and that's that's the short of it the the other point to make um clear is that what we call kind of illness disease or whatever they are are really just collections of symptoms but symptoms aren't a bad thing and that's why you know you shouldn't take um things like antibiotics to suppress them because they are part as david said part of the body's processes of clearing things i mean you know if your nose is running then your body's getting rid of stuff you know if you're yeah. coughing or whatever you know fever again sort of is is heating the body sort of producing sweat and your skin is obviously uh, ex, uh, expelling toxins you know because that's one of the ways the body does that so symptoms are not bad um and, and that's again completely inverted from how we've been taught because um you know oh well, if you've got symptoms you've got to stop them so you take this you stop your symptoms oh you feel better well that's it you know you're you're over your illness well no but you've suppressed the symptoms so you've stopped your body from doing what it's supposed to do so that's why um antibiotics are are believed to work because the symptoms stop but that isn't a good thing because all it, all they're doing is suppressing the symptoms and um increasing the body's toxic load so again it's it's really understanding that these symptoms are not things to be afraid of and not things oh it's not something bad and it's really to learn how to look after yourself with these symptoms is to to recognize that what's going on in your body to to rest <laughs> more than anything else you know drink drink water probably but to to just give your body the time to do what it needs to do which is to clear clear these symptoms and you know so of course the medical establishment doesn't want to know that because they like to um, keep promoting all their all their pharmaceuticals for us to uh, keep taking and become perpetual customers. So, um, but it, it's it, again, you know, something else that's inverted. So that we we still think that we need to go to somebody else for our health when, in truth, we can actually take responsibility for our own health. So it's, but it does require kind of understanding 
what these symptoms are and realizing that you know none of these things that are called germs cause anything it's a lot it's a it's a big thing it's quite a lot to take in but one of the things we had to do in our research was to have a look at how doctors are trained mm. because we thought you know things obviously became it became apparent that everything we'd been taught throughout our lives up to that point was totally wrong about the medical establishment so we thought well surely all doctors can't know the truth <laughs> and they're just lying to their patients we thought well that can't be true so we studied how doctors were trained and we talked to doctors how they were trained and it soon became Oh, oh, right. Oh, we're okay. back. Sorry about that. Yeah, go on. Go on. OK, so we yeah, I thought you'd frozen. <laughs> we had to uh, we had to have a look how doctors were trained. So um, again, kind of long story short, and after we talked to doctors about their training, it, we basically we could see where the problem was when they went to medical college. You know, they were bombarded with information, none of which they were able to um investigate for themselves they were not able to do any independent research they were not able to ask questions you know if they were said well this bacteria causes this disease and this is the drug you give this virus causes this disease and this is the drug you give for that they were never able to ask well how do you know how do you know mr lecturer how do you know where are the scientific papers that prove this bacteria does that or this virus does that they're never allowed to ask those questions they were never shown any scientific papers um so they just had to take it on good faith that what they were being taught was the truth so you can see after five years five or six years of indoctrination uh they believed what they were taught the same as any of us when we're trained in whatever profession we go into uh we come out believing what we've been taught and then we then practice it and doctors are the same so we found that doctors didn't know hardly anything about nutrition they didn't know anything about the contents of vaccines <laughs> which yeah. was a real shock um and as i say they just take, took at face value that this or that germ was responsible for causing this or that disease it was as simple as that just learning by rote yeah. um which is a big shock but you can see why doctors come out being little more than drug pro providers really uh, because that's what they've been taught to do and of course the pharmaceutical companies love that uh, because that's how they sell their products and make billions of dollars worldwide um, and, and no one gets well in fact people just get worse i mean in america when we studied the system over there um I mean, it's the most medicated country in the world. <clears throat> More money is spent on pharmaceutical products over there. And yet uh, it's got one of the poorest rates of health. You know, there are more sick people in America than anywhere else. And yet they're taking more medication than anyone else. So yeah. it speaks for itself. And there's a thing called iatrogenesis, which is basically translates as uh, death by modern medicine, <laughs> where... Yeah. Um, uh, you know, we talk about it in the book where people are being prescribed drugs by their doctor. They're taking them as prescribed and it's killing them. And there's at least over 150,000 people in America alone that die every year from mitrogenesis. And anywhere in the world where so-called Western medicine is practiced, you're going to get similar outcomes, obviously, depending on the country's population it will vary but it's a very very high number so worldwide that's going to translate into millions of people dying every year just by taking the drugs that their doctor has prescribed for them in fact we we have a a retired gp in the uk called dr vernon coleman he's quite famous on the internet and uh, he's got went public and said the person most likely to kill you is your doctor yeah now that's that's quite an admission coming from a doctor yeah. <laughs> so that should concentrate people's minds a little i think but not intentional again no, you know no. make it clear you know they it's 
I, I mean, it, we might talk more about the education system, well, the schooling system, shall we say. Um, and part of that is really to uh, to be given uh, data that you then regurgitate in the exams in order to pass. And then uh, so if, if you're questioning anything or if you're doubting anything, you are not going to get through those exams so you're not going to get any qualifications so that's where the indoctrination starts and the repression of any um any thoughts of questioning your tutors or um teachers or, or sort of you know or, or even the authority so mm -hmm. people are uh you know by the time they get into those sort of adult training they're they're already less likely to question the so-called authorities and the uh, experts but, and also you know if you're working as in the field of science and you have you know professors who are you know well known or they've got years you know it's it would take a very brave young um new new uh, new student or new scientist you know just sort of starting in the area to actually question the sort of professor who's been in that field for 30 years or whatever um because you assume they know their field and so you don't question it even if sometimes and I've had this I've heard this from scientists that I know that they they say I'm not quite sure about that but they just don't dare question these professors you know because I mean there's there's obvious there's obvious respect you know for these people in their fields but the you just don't question them yeah and if you aren't happy with what's going on you know people just leave the field so um that's the thing that is it's difficult to stay unless you do follow follow the procedures and just keep going within that field because you you won't make progress and of course you know once people have qualified as either a scientist or a doctor you know they've got so much money invested in, in that qualification right and usually huge student debts to pay back and we, we also found out when we were talking to doctors and researching how they were trained that um, most of the uh, training colleges were either partly or wholly owned by the pharmaceutical companies. OK, and the curriculums that the doctors had to sit were set by the pharmaceutical companies and the college libraries were stocked by the pharmaceutical companies mm -hmm. and many of the lecturers were employed one of the pharmaceutical companies. So you can see what you're going to get. You're going to get doctors coming out who are, you know, blinded to the truth and everything they know is to do with pharmacology, you know. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. that's why I said it. Some people may think I'm being uncharitable when I say the doctors really just become professional drug pushers, you know, can that's uh, <laughs> that's yeah. really what it is because that's what they're taught to do. Mm -hmm. uh, I was really going through this predicament that you're discussing right here because I had an idea in my head that I could go ahead and you know change the system and be a pioneer and then I realized pretty quickly that, that I would have to go through a lot of years of just just sitting there quietly as I knew what I was being told was wrong and um, I decided that and I you know ultimately I decided it probably wouldn't be worth my time to do that but um, it, it, would, it was a tough choice. So, you know, um, I want to really quickly ask another question about the, the bacteria thing. Um, so from my understanding, what bacteria actually do is remove like the weakened and the, the dead cells. So it makes sense why the antibiotics are so harmful because these bacteria are aiding in the detoxification process. Yeah. So when you take an antibiotic, you're going to kill those bacteria that are helping you get sick. But at the same time, that sickness is necessary to expel toxins. So I guess my question is, is it possible that um, antibiotics do yield some some short term benefits potentially by making you so sick that you have to remove that antibiotic, which may be less stressful than removing the actual toxins that, that those bacteria are removing themselves? Because I do hear some examples, may, maybe, you know, it's just coincidence, but people take an antibiotic and they get better. So do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think Dawn touched on it a little earlier, because when you take many of these drugs, and antibiotics are one of them, they suppress symptoms, okay? So people think, oh, I, I feel better. My 
headache's gone, my fever's gone, or whatever it is. Um, but they've just suppressed the symptoms, and the body's then struggling to do what it... Uh, let, me, let me put it this way. Only the body can heal itself. Only the body can heal itself. There is no drug, and I've, we've challenged doctors and pharmacologists to prove any drug that they produce actually cures anything, and that's yeah. quite a bold statement. There is no pharma, yes. there's no pharmacy uh, product that cures anything. They just suppress symptoms. Okay, they do some great painkillers, but again, it's just suppressing symptoms. You know, you can take morphine; it'll, you know, you can be seriously injured. Take morphine, and yes, it will suppress the pain. It doesn't cure anything. And all of uh, pharmacological drugs are the same. They just suppress symptoms, basically, while the body struggles to heal itself. And if uh, you're lucky, <laughs> you your body will heal itself, that it's not been poisoned too much, unlike when they give you chemotherapy drugs, because they keep giving you them, <laughs> basically, till you die, yeah. and then, then tell you people you've died of cancer. But... Um, so, no, there is no good reason. And again, the short answer is you can't poison the body back to health. So bearing in mind that antibiotics are a poison, they're a toxin, the body recognizes it as that. So it's, it's not actually going to help the body. Only the body can heal itself. So the, it gives people the false impression that the antibiotics have actually made them better. But all it's done is suppress the symptoms while the body gets on and heals the problem. Okay. But by stopping the symptoms, it's actually uh, hindering the body from continuing the processes. And so that, and that's why it's, um, it's really hard when people say, yeah, but, you know, I stopped having what, whatever it was that was going on, all these different symptoms, and, and think that that means that they are better. But that's that's where the misunderstanding lies that it is um that however if they feel better that is only a temporary thing because what's happened is the body will then have to deal with the antibiotic now the reason for this well first of all uh, say the reason for the cells dying i mean cells die all the time and they are processed and and eliminated from the body normally uh, a healthy body will be doing that all the time so cells dying does not mean you've got a disease you know it's it's just a, a normal process because cells are renewing all the time now the healthier the body the healthier the new cells will be so as i say cells dying is um is not a a bad process but when um when there's sort of an excess toxicity in the body then they will die at a, a higher rate than normal and right. that's why you need the sort of you need the bacteria to come in and help break that down you know because like you say that's what bacteria fungi do out in the natural world you know they break down dead and dying material because if they didn't we'd be miles high in dead and dying you know dead matter that they haven't broken down and recycled back into the environment so why you know the reason that people think that that's what happens in out there in nature but in our bodies they turn into some horrific monster um mm. But it's it's the idea that you you've got to take something to to kill something, then if it's something that kills you know designed to kill bacteria, then it it is inherently toxic. So you just you know you, you have to wonder why um, people would think taking a toxin is a good idea. Yeah. So you know I mean with with um, what are called infections, um, one of the things. Um, that are you know various people uh, who actually practice it you know have um, patients and and help them restore them to help or restore themselves to health is is through fasting is is actually to to just not eat and then the body's not putting all its energy into processing food and then it can just put its energy into healing and quite often um, they find that people who you know, go on a short fast or whatever, their bodies can heal naturally. I mean, if, you know, if you cut your finger, you just, as long as you keep it clean and don't, um, you know, put anything toxic on it, it, the, it, it will heal itself. You know, the body will heal itself. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think animals in nature fast when they're sick. So exactly. um, pretty clear that if we're sick and we're not hungry, then there's no point to force down food. Um, okay. So the, the, there's a lot of 
logical extensions that come as a result of bacteria and, and virus not being caused not being the cause of disease for example the immune system and this is something that i thought of instantly as soon as i was exposed to the idea that um louis, louis pasteur was wrong and it's you know it's not germs that cause disease so you know th th this was hard for me to accept because we're told so often like we need to wash our hands do this to boost your immune system vitamin c boosts your immune system so you can fight off stuff and like it's crazy that, that all that's wrong but so i guess the question is what is the immune system and does it even exist at all okay well first Good of all question, can, yeah. just one point is is that you know the idea that the body is just that this battleground of things fighting each other is is completely false as well you know because it's you know it's it's harm you know the well if body was fighting itself all the time then you know we'll, we'd always be ill and we're not yeah. so it, it's it's the wrong concept but it's made it's put out there to make us feel that we have to defer our responsibility to to these um you know to the medical people so or the medical system anyway um but but the body is you know it works in harmony it's not in it's not a battleground well the important yeah. thing because i'm glad you asked the question about immune, the immune system because it's always one that people um get confused about uh, particularly when we say the body doesn't have an immune system it, it doesn't have an immune system it has a repair and maintenance system but it doesn't have an immune system as we're told by the medical establishment now well, their idea of, a, of the immune system is that they can usually inject you with something that will then cause the body <clears throat> to produce what they call antibodies mm -hmm. which are specific to the germ that they're supposed to supposedly making you immune to um, and that these specialized antibodies will then stay in your blood system and circulate around your body for years maybe until that unhappy day when it, it's attacked by one of these fictitious germs and then these antibodies will swoop in and kill the germ and you will be well and this is what they tell us the immune system is but we don't have one of those. Why would we? Why would the body want one when yeah. he knows it's not being attacked by germs? Germs aren't what make it ill. So, and of course, this whole whole idea of being able to inject something into you to produce these specific antibodies has never been seen. Mm -hmm. it, it's a complete myth. You know, no one has ever shown that that happens and that uh, the body produces these specialized antibodies it's just a medical myth and uh, we we research this very carefully and uh, more and more people are realizing that that is just a story <laughs> put out by the pharmaceutical stroke medical system because it then justifies them injecting you with various things from a syringe mm -hmm. because if you realize that one is germs don't make you ill Two is that the body doesn't have an immune system. The next question you would ask is, why do I need to be injected with something then? Yeah. And of course, they don't want you, they don't want you to know that because <laughs> the whole thing falls apart. Right. So they've got to keep this myth of the immune system going so they can keep justifying injecting things into your bloodstream. Mm. Okay, it's it, it's very uh, refreshing to hear. You say that because I, like I've heard some places people say that there's no immune system, but you just say it with such confidence as if you know it. And and I, I know it, too. There, there can't be an immune system because there's nothing to fight off. So, yeah, the, okay. it's, it's, it's nice to hear you say that. Um, I think a really interesting part of your book was the, the section about infectious diseases and what actually has caused them through history. So you said that the four uh, causes of disease today are um food, chemicals, EMF, and stress. And um, if a lot of that stuff didn't really exist hundreds of years ago, or, or, or it did to a degree, but um, the EMF was reduced, maybe lives were less stressful, the chemicals weren't there, and food didn't wasn't sprayed with glyphosate, and it was generally whole uh, organic foods all the time. What was the cause of disease and all of these alleged uh, pandemics through history? Well, the first thing is, um, yes, there weren't sort of synthetic chemicals, but there were um, other substances in the environment that people could be exposed to. 
Um, so that's, you know, it's yes, the chemical industry is quite modern, but there are what you might call natural chemicals, you know, um, and things like mining uh, have been, you know, the, they expose people to various um, substances, you know, there are natural phenomena like, you know, volcanoes and earthquakes that put um, toxic material into the atmosphere and, and, not into, ever, the water. and into the water. Um, yeah. So again, they can poison and animal, if there isn't sufficient sanitation, you know, um, human and animal wastes aren't cleared away. The water can be contaminated by the waste and that's not to do with bacteria, that's to do with contamination. So there are lots of possibilities you know be, before the kind of chemical industry but I, I think you obviously want to go into or it sounds like you want to go into some of the uh, some specifics on that I mean well, did you want to cover let's talk let's just think about mining uh, I mean Dawn mentioned mining I mean that's been going on for thousands of years mm. now when whenever you dig into the earth you know they were usually digging for lead which is toxic they were digging for gold and silver but of course within mining it exposes all sorts of gases and toxic materials to the miners and so and into the water and, yeah, as you said and into the water supplies uh, so that's one source uh, i mean arsenic of course is a naturally occurring thing um <clears throat> uranium is a natural occurring thing all of these things are toxic okay wherever you've got lead and much of that well, was certainly in the uk all over the UK, there's lots of uh, the remnants of lead mining, which had been done even by the Romans, who were here several thousand years ago. For what they, purpose? They were mining for lead, or they had people like mining for lead. Wherever they you... used them for, I think they used them for the um, pipes, didn't they? Water. Yeah. They used them. The so yeah, so the water was run through lead pipes. So, um, <laughs> yes, I mean they toxic. used it was. I think they also used uh, it was sweet, so they used it as a, a sort of sweetener for wines. Yeah. You know, this they yeah. When once you start looking back, right. you realise they were using toxic materials and and arsenic what was used as a. As as a so called medicine, you know, and mercury, thousands of years. Yeah, mercury yeah. of course. Hundreds I mean, years, yeah. I mean, people were being treated. You know, people were. <laughs> we might get into uh, sexually transmitted diseases, which, uh, as we examine in our book and show, there's no such thing. You know, people have these things for other reasons. But one of the things that the medical establishment used to treat uh, some of these se so called sexually transmitted diseases, that and syphilis was one of them. They treated people with mercury. Well, I mean, that's highly toxic, highly poisonous. And it's hardly surprising that uh, many of the people treated that way died. Um, so, yes, there were lots of different toxic materials available. But as Dawn mentioned, not least of which was when you get um, bodies, whether it's animal bodies or human bodies or even rats, when flesh starts to decay, and break down it breaks down into very toxic materials and when you've not got proper clean water supplies <clears throat> those toxic materials get into the water supply which people mm -hmm. are drinking and then they get in poison and hence then you get the rise of so-called diseases like smallpox and cholera, uh, and, cholera mm -hmm. and all these others well through... they're called <clears throat> get these names yeah but it's through poisoned water poisoning is the biggest culprit and it's just it, and this was part of our research was to try and nail down what the actual poison or poisons were that were actually causing the illnesses because we could never find a germ to be the cause we knew that people got ill we knew that people died so we wanted to find out <laughs> what really made people ill and as i say it always boiled down to the four factors that we mentioned and toxicity in the olden days, as you say, when EMFs were not as rife as they are today, um, but lots of different toxins were, and uh, and th those were the main causes why people uh, got sick and died, mainly because of uh, unclean food and unclean water, poisoned food and poisoned water, you know, not to mistake and think it's to do with bacteria, because it wasn't, it's to do with proper toxins and uh, that's what killed people and of course many people going back far enough in time 
they didn't have what we would think of as a nutritious diet. They may have food, but it might just be um, very, very basic, you know, very basic bread, bread, water and or bread and beer and uh, maybe some meat. Um, they they didn't have very good diets. Well, that's there's not enough nutrition in what they were eating. So their bodies were not able to maintain themselves properly. And so you'd get all sorts of skin type diseases like syphilis, like leprosy, all of these yeah. things, which the root cause is uh, lack of proper nutrition okay, yeah. and toxicity. And, and it seems like these really feed into each other. Like um, our, our environment today is, is so toxic. And um, if we're malnourished, we just don't have the proper detoxing mechanisms because it's pretty taxing on the minerals, on our mineral stores to get rid of stuff like mercury and aluminum in the brain. So if we're depleting those rapidly and we're not replenishing it with proper food, then it's just a recipe for disaster and stress, throwing stress and EMF, like you mentioned yeah. in there, it's just going to make it pretty bad. Um, so yeah, like I think, I think it'd be interesting to get into uh, other examples of ways that we're told we can we contract diseases like from animals and from other human beings and via sex. So can you talk a little bit about that and, and why those narratives are wrong? Okay. Uh, well, which to start with? I mean, quite a favorite one because um, it normally comes up and that's with STD, sexually transmitted diseases. And, you know, the uh, such as syphilis or even herpes, you know. Um, now, I mentioned syphilis uh, because, again, um, if people have been exposed to various toxic materials, um, the body, the skin is the body's largest organ. So one of the main uh, organs of elimination is the skin. It will try, the body will try and push toxins out through the skin. So then you will get rashes, blisters, boils, all of that sort of thing um, on the skin. But the again, the medical establishment are give it different names depending on what those spots and blisters and rashes are. Yeah, they, they and they, where they appear. Where they appear. Yeah, yeah. So, so particularly if they're around the genital genital area, they'll say, well, it's obviously a sexually transmitted disease. But that's not the case. I mean, the body will push toxins out through any area. And if if that area of the body happens to be, shall we say, warmer and moisture, more moist than other areas, that's an easy way through sweat to uh, or perspiration, shall we say, to push toxins out. So that might just be the genital area or around the buttocks or under the armpits uh, because they're warm and moist, more moist than other parts of the body. But it's, it's well, also the lymph. Uh, anyway, yeah. yeah, the lymph glands. But it, it's just the body using the skin as a, a, its main organ to push toxins out. And um, again, with any of those so-called sexually transmitted diseases I've just mentioned, it's never been proven that they're caused by a germ, you know, a virus or a bacteria. It's never been proven. It's just assumed. No one has ever been able to prove that. Um, so <laughs> that's quite interesting and maybe a great relief to, to people to realize they've not caught some disease. Uh, the body is just expressing symptoms to get rid of some toxic material. Okay. There is one other point to be made on that, um, and that sort of um, alludes a little bit to the full factor that we call stress, but is is quite a wide factor because because it also includes um, our own beliefs and fears and ideas, which can come under either the placebo nocebo effect, um, where. Um, I mean, the nocebo effect is where you can manifest symptoms simply by believing that you can do that. So, um, in, I mean, like simply with a, say, what's called a cold, you know, the symptoms of what we call a cold, people can say, oh, well, you know, I stay away from me. I don't want your cold. And, you know, the next day, oh, well, I caught your cold. It's a, it's a belief because nothing is transmitted, they think. And that can be so strong that it can actually manifest symptoms. So sometimes there is a fear, and that's why the last three years have been um, largely about pumping fear out into people. And, uh, and there is quite a large association of 
um fear uh, well there is is quite a close association between fear anxiety and the manifestation of certain symptoms you know there, there's quite a close correlation now i know people say correlation doesn't prove causation but there is plenty of evidence that shows that people can manifest symptoms simply from a, an inert sugar pill so that this, this is a very real phenomenon so i'm not saying it's in all cases but there are some people who may fear that they can catch something or they have caught something from somebody else and that could be anywhere on the on their body and if they've got you know various hang-ups or whatever something to do with sex and that you know it, it could end up manifesting in in that part of the body the other thing with um um, those sorts of areas that you know various products may be used that contain and um, certainly contain sort of fragrances which are pretty toxic chemicals and the body just may um, not like those chemicals and then decide to manifest symptoms uh, you know express the kind of rashes and lumps and bumps and blisters um, that then get given this label um, so again yeah. this is about labeling and even they say even though they it's it's given a label that's then said oh well you've got whatever herpes it's caused by the herpes virus there is no such thing that has ever been seen that the herpes virus is is not something that has ever been proven to exist so it but the but the whole idea you know but calling it you know herpes virus just keeps that belief in the idea that what is called herpes is caused by a virus so again this is this is this is continuing the belief so that people don't look at anything else and that's why it's, it's quite important but again as i say what, what's been going on the last three years has has been quite a good example of um how fear and being kept in a perpetual state of anxiety is is detrimental to people's health and and that's you know been one of the problems as well so again it's it's all mixed in and i've kind of gone off slightly to tangent but again it's still one of the factors that some people might need to have a think about when it comes I mean, to even, all of these symptoms even the pharmaceutical companies i mean in their drug trials mm. they use the placebo effect you know they they have if they're bringing out a new drug they have let's say two groups of people one they're giving their new drug to the other group they're giving the placebo pill to which is as dawn has said just a sugar pill has no pharmacological uh, properties at all but of course neither group knows which pill they've been given and there are many recorded instances say with a chemotherapy drug where the people who've actually only had the sugar pill but think they've had the chemotherapy drug have even manifested symptoms of hair loss now mm. because that's what wow. they believe they'd have so yeah. belief is very powerful thing and um you know you, you can look back into uh, all sorts of different societies whether it's witchcraft or shamans in some instances they know the power of thought they know the power of belief and uh, it, it's a very powerful thing and the modern pharmaceutical companies and doctors know this too i mean even within medical terms they uh, they know the expression called dying of the diagnosis. You mm. know, a doctor knows that they can give a particular, if they're unwise, give a particular diagnosis to someone and that will affect them very badly, even to the point of, you know, if they think they've got three months to live, that's what they'll do. They'll die in three months. You know, it's dying of the diagnosis. And uh, so doctors or anyone for that matter should be very careful if they if they hold a position of authority i.e doctors you know they've got the white coat on and the stethoscope and if someone believes in them that what they say is definitely true so whatever that doctor tells them will have the effect of the placebo pill or nocebo pill as it should yeah. be called because it will have this detrimental effect because this man in the white coat has said so uh, very very powerful and very dangerous yeah no yeah. doubt that the mind is powerful um i i heard of, of a study where two different groups were given the same milkshake but one was told that it's super healthy and one was told that it's really bad for them and the one um who received the information that it's healthy even though it wasn't 
had a, a lower blood sugar spike, um, like the different, a different physiological response just from the brain, mm -hmm. which is cool. And there's also a lot of interesting stuff with resonance where, you know, women's menstrual cycles will sink. And there's, there's a lot of things that go on w with the mind that people tend to neglect. I I'm curious if you think that maybe uh, bioresonance has anything to do with families getting sick at the same time, um, because that does seem to happen. And I have heard that as uh, an, uh, an opposed argument to um, germ theory being incorrect. Well, there are, um, it, it's one of many possibilities, but again, with a family being ill at the same time, you mm -hmm. have to recognize that they are in the same environment. They're probably eating the same food. They're exposed to the same EMFs or toxins or whatever. So uh, again, this kind of environmental, um, uh, you know, food eating and potential stress or whatever and similar belief systems as well and the water Possibly. they're drinking well yes i mean all of that so there are similar exposures within a family um that could be one of the reasons um and there's, but again, a, and there's the nocebo effect you know mm. some members come down with it so the rest think they will get it yeah, yeah. but you're quite right you you mentioned uh, by a residence, mm. yes, the There's that too, yeah. the body, as we mentioned earlier, does have an electrical field, and wherever you've got an electrical field, mm. I know, you know, my where I'm retired now, but I was a, an electrical engineer for many many years, and so I know that all electrical systems put out an electrical field, and the human body is no different, and so when you're in close proximity to someone, your biofields, your electrical fields, can intermingle. And you and it, it can give sensations of various sorts, you know, even if it's just making you feel that uh, you have an affinity with a person or a certain person may even repel you and you, yeah. but you don't know why. And this can be because your bio feels um, uh, don't sink. <clears throat> mm. OK, so information can be passed through these bio fields. And uh, I'm not saying that they make you sick, but you can pick up information that can make you think you should be sick <laughs> and then the mind makes you sick because you feel you should be well it's it's not again sort of being sick but again it's uh, it's um coming out in sympathy symptoms, yeah. in in the, the symptoms so you sort of made like coming out in sympathy but i mean um you know there's nothing um contagious about sort of you know yawning or whatever but sometimes when somebody yawns it makes somebody else yawn but there's nothing transmitted you know there yeah. isn't a yawning germ you know so it's it's that there's there is something else going on because again um we're sort of moving to other areas but i mean we are all kind of you know interconnected in in various ways and so we're sort of picking up on each other's um um consciousness shall we say yeah. we won't yeah. go into that one um, and I sort of go somewhere else. But uh, uh, yes, I mean, there are all sorts of reasons and it's it won't ever be. And this is the problem. Some people want, well, if it's not this one thing, what is the other one thing? And it's not just one thing. It will always be various combinations. And that's why we're all different. Or, well, we are all different. And that's why the expression of symptoms, the duration, severity will be different. So even within a family, not everyone is going to be express the same symptoms for the same length of time in the same way there may be some may have a, sort of a few mild symptoms and some may have slightly and some, more. Not, and some none, none at all it, exactly yeah. so again you know people are all different and so it's you can't well if if they're experiencing different symptoms it can't be the same thing um, but again it, it just depends on their own bodies what their bodies um are needing to express in terms of symptoms we often say to people we may not be able to tell you exactly what mm -hmm. it is that's made mm -hmm. you feel ill but we can tell you what it's not <laughs> and we can tell you quite definitely it's not a germ uh, but to tell you what it is in your particular circumstance we'd have to know a lot more about your life what you're eating drinking sleeping habits work work environment we'd have to know all of those things to be able to give you some reasonable idea but that's why we boiled it down to the four factors so that people can then have a look at their own life environment and say, what of these four factors could be making me feel ill? Yes. And uh, 
and then they can sort that out for themselves with it, whether it's what they're eating, drinking, what they're exposed to, chemicals, EMF, stress. They can they can look into their life and decide what are those symptoms uh, could be affecting them. Yeah, the, the the point of view that you've brought to the table is way more empowering than germ theory, which is just kind of uh, promotes fear. And I mean, there's, there's a clear monetary incentive for um, germ theory being right because they can make their medicines and, and their antibiotics and stuff like that. But there, there's it's pretty clear to me that they also want to promote fear, fear of nature, fear of other human beings, fear of STDs, fear of animals. You're going to get anthrax or rabies. Um, but, but I think the significant one is fear of other human beings, you know, wearing masks, being scared to associate with people being scared. Yeah. So what do you think is um, the motive with that, with that uh, fear agenda? The, the money one is clear, but why, why do they, these elites benefit from making us scared? Well, people are, when people are afraid, it's well known when people are afraid, they're much more easily manipulated. And uh, we, we know that in the UK, that our government, um, when this whole, since 2020 and this whole last three years, they they employed about half a dozen psychologists uh, to help them produce statements to be released to the public that would induce fear. You know, they did this deliberately because yeah. they knew that if they could make the public afraid enough, they would be much more likely to comply with all of these measures that they then wanted to bring in of, you know, locking people up in their homes and not visiting your loved ones, wearing masks and all of these other things, people were much more likely to comply if they were afraid. And so they ramped up the fear through the media daily. It was nonstop. Um, I mean, it's subsided a lot now, but, you know, it was a very, very active plan um, to control people, basically. Uh, when people are afraid, they're much more easy to control. So again, as well as fear being detrimental physically to the body, uh, um, you know, it, it has this other side when the persons or persons that are uh, making you afraid can then control you better. So there is another agenda, as I'm sure we know, um, for controlling the world population. And through and fear, using fear is one of them. Used to be fear of World War Three, wasn't it? You know, they back in the day, it'd be everyone's made afraid that there's going to be another nuclear war or a nuclear war, should I say, another war, and it would be a nuclear war, and everyone was made to be afraid of that. They were afraid, you know, or then they went through. Everyone had to be afraid of terrorists blowing up their house right. or blowing up their business or something. And then, of course, then it was disease. You know, everyone had got to be afraid of disease. So this is a constant thing that's put out by governments to keep people afraid of one thing or another so that they can control them better. It's it's a fear-based system. Okay. Yeah, de definitely a, a fear-based system. And um, I think the whole germ theory is wrong idea corroborated what I previously learned from historical events. Like the U.S. had tried to pretend Cuba had attacked us, m you know, more fear tactics. And I think 9-11, that was another just in like in instilling fear in us. So we're scared of, you know, um, terrorists in, in Afghanistan and stuff like that. And then they can spy on us. So th there seems to be the, the, the fear really allows them to do a, a lot of stuff, certainly. Um, maybe uh, we can pivot a little bit and talk about the education system. I, we touched on it briefly. But um, and like I, I explained my situation a little bit, but you both have pretty uh, in-depth academic backgrounds, um, but discovered these truths about disease and the world using your own investigation. So I'm curious to hear how you feel about formal education and I guess the pros and cons of getting one. OK, well, it's fair enough. I mean, uh, yes, I mean, in short, I mean, we look on what we used to call education and that's why we very carefully use the word indoctrination, because people are trained, you know, to put it bluntly, we're trained to be slaves. We're trained to obey, obey authority of one sort or another, whether it's the teachers when we start school or when we go on to college and to 
or the police or the government, you know, the army. We're trained to obey and believe in authority and to believe that authority has a right to tell us what to do and to micromanage our lives. You know, we're told that that's, we're taught that's what we're supposed to do. And people do it without even believing it, without even realizing it. They believe they're free, but they're not. We're also taught at school, right from an early age, we're taught things like uh, Darwinism. You know, I know when I grew up, you know, that all sounded a very logical thing. Uh, Darwin's theory of evolution, that, uh, you know, we all originated back in the dim and distant past from pond oh, scum yes. and uh, slowly something came out of the seas and, you know, and then we have the whole variety of animals that we've got today. But when you look at the fossil record, when you look for the science of it, there's nothing to support that. You know, you can see there can be variations within a species, but there's no evidence to show that one species has evolved into another. You know, that fish have evolved into mammals and then a whole variety of different mammals, whether it's elephants and giraffes or, yeah. you know, there's no there's no scientific evidence to support that. So we have to ask ourselves, well, what is that about? Well, it's all part of this uh, making us feel, and we're often told that we're quite insignificant, really, you know, that we evolved from, as I say, pond scum, and we're of no, we're just a biological accident, really. And within the scheme of the universe, we're of no particular importance, and it wouldn't really matter whether we're here or not. So this is the theme of making us feel insignificant, powerless, of no particular importance. Well, we are very important. Humanity is extremely important. And, uh, you know, we have a role to play. And we're in a very, we'll get into other areas if we're not careful. We're in, we're in a, a very special time at the moment where there is, a, there is an evolution, but it's an evolution in consciousness. It's an evolution in, in awakening and uh, where humanity will take a different step forward. And uh, it's been brought about largely by what's been happening over the last three years, because more and more people we know from the people that contact us and who we talk to, more and more people have woken up and have realized there's something very wrong, not only with the medical establishment, um, but also with all the other things like the legal system, like um, the banking system, the education system. So people have started to question all of these things all of the things that they took for granted were right and proper. And now they're saying and realizing that that's just not so, that they've been lied to about just about everything of yeah. any importance. And uh, and that's a good thing. So that people, and we're not talking about violent opposition. We're just talking about people waking up and being educated so that they can make informed decisions about all of these things so that they, they do not they do not have to put their health in the hands of the medical establishment, which doesn't actually help them. They can start to make uh, inroads into changing the so-called legal system, the government system, the banking system, which most people are waking up and realizing is extremely fraudulent with the lending money at interest. You know, it's a, a, it's a fraudulent usury. It's a fraudulent exercise so all of these things people are now starting to question so this is a good thing and this is the evolution in consciousness which is happening all around us uh, at the moment and this is this is really good it's an exciting time to be alive in actual fact it is. and uh, uh, so people should seize it with both hands and uh, start to question they must question everything uh, particularly the so-called authorities. They must question the authorities, everything they do. So in terms of um, sort of education, I mean, it, it's there is such a thing as education and it's, it's about learning. It's developing our own uh, abilities, capabilities, creativity, um, and really allowing us to learn to find out what um what where our strengths are and to play to our strengths because obviously the school system gets everyone to kind of you know cover a, a, a broad curriculum and everyone has to do the same thing and it's only with you know people you know children of the same age so there, there's lots of ways of 
um, suppressing and repressing and again making children learn certain things at certain ages whereas it may not be for the child themselves a kind of the right time for them to learn you know uh, but it's also to allow them to learn for themselves when they're ready um so you know you were saying sort of you know educating yourself I mean that's that's really what um what true education is is you know um children for children to allow children to learn for themselves when they're ready to find out what they want I mean um I know of examples of uh, somebody had said their their sort of child was very creative in certain areas but didn't want to read um mm. now in in within the school system that child would have been made to read by whatever the age was I can't remember um but at, suddenly at some point that child decided they wanted to read and of course, it's so much. I mean, I'm sure most people can sort of uh, relate to this. But when when you find something you're interested in, you really, really go into it in in depth, and you want to learn. So there's the enthusiasm and the excitement, and therefore you're going to put the energy into learning. So you really are going to learn that topic. So when you're ready for it, and when it's something you're interested in, is to really, you know, to allow that to be. Um, but we're not allowed to sort of pursue certain topics certainly not on our own uh, yeah. and they're always gauged within these very narrow confines of whatever the system is to make sure that they carry on following the system and of course once you're invested in the system it's very difficult to sort of see outside of it but that's that's happening as well even within science and the legal system people are seeing outside of it so it's it, it but yeah it's it's very hard to know that um practically everything you thought you knew about almost everything <laughs> is is actually not true you've almost got to start learning again you know it can be tough but it's still exciting because you go well I've got loads more to learn so it's yeah you know. I mean although both Dawn and I had formal educations both at school and college of course later on uh, to learn our professions but I can honestly say well I'm sure Dawn would agree we've we've learned more about the world how it truly works and all of these other things since we left formal education mm. you know because we carried on studying you can see some of the books in our library behind us we have that's many fun, hundreds and hundreds uh, because that's where we've studied to educate ourselves about all of these different things and so uh, health was just one of them but of course history is another you know we we're not told the truth about our history and uh, civilization, as we mentioned, evolution, we, we're not told the truth about anything of yeah. any importance. And for very good reason, it's to keep us confined and under control. Because once we know, once we know who we truly are, and I'm thinking not only physically, but also spiritually as well, once we know what we truly are, and just how powerful we are, then it's a very different world indeed, and our lives take on a very different form. So uh, <clears throat> that's that's the sort of education we should get, but don't right. when we're when we're in formal education. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I actually I recall when I was learning about the evolution being wrong stuff, and I was really hoping. I was like, oh, I I don't want to believe that that this is not true because it had uh it was a backbone of like my whole biology education and. I mean, when I was learning all this stuff, a part of me was really dying for for it to all all the conspiracies to just not be true. And then one by one, they each start to make more and more sense, and everything gets put together. And every time I, I unlock something, you know, whether it's a war that was like conspired by the Rothschilds, or it was you know buildings blown up by the government, it's like it just unlocks more and more things. So, um. It, there have been there have definitely been hard times in my in my journey to understand truths, but it's definitely rewarding. And like you said, with the legal system and the monetary system, definitely allows you to make informed decisions about how to secure a, a safe life for yourself and a happy one. So may, maybe touching on the monetary system, um, what do you think is the is the is the solution? Well, I on mean, a personal level, yeah. The the basic thing we really need is to. Uh, for the people of the country of each country to have control of the banking system okay because all the banks are owned 
by private individuals and the and that's the whole banking system throughout the world so they're allowed to get away with lending money at interest okay uh, which is a ridiculous system and is very restricting for people uh, because the, so the whole world gets run on debt you know people are imprisoned by debt um so that wouldn't happen if the people actually own the banks and money could be lent without interest okay and this can be done um you know if if we had honest governments the governments should run the banks for the people um so that's the first thing i mean yes it's a big ask <laughs> because obviously there's be a lot of opposition uh, because there's a lot of extremely rich people who own the banking systems who definitely do not want that to happen. But that's one of the things that has to happen. Um, I mean, one of the things, as we all know at the moment, they're trying to bring in, get rid of, get rid of cash and just have digital money. Now, <clears throat> that will be extremely detrimental. It's going to be awful. Uh, because... Dreadful. If you if there's no cash and the you can only buy things through a piece of plastic, you know, um, then they've got you total control because they can switch that card off anytime they like. If you're a naughty boy or girl and don't do what they want, the they can control. Stuff. They can, oh yes, they yeah. can control where you spend your money. You know what you spend it. What on. you spend it on. They've got complete control just through that little bit of plastic. If we allow them to get away with getting rid of cash and that's why they want to do it you know they try to tell us it's all going to be so much more convenient well of course it is isn't it when you go down the supermarket and use your bit of plastic to buy your groceries but that's the thin end of the wedge you know when people get complacent and think oh it's oh so convenient i don't have to carry a load of cash around with me well yes but rue the day when cash disappears completely and your only way of getting something is with your bit of plastic, because that's when they've got us. So we mustn't let that happen. Um, I mean, a lot of people say, oh, you know, sort of money's, um, you know, like money's evil. It's it's uh, um, that sort of misunderstanding. It, it's just a tool in the same way as, you know, we're using all of this system. You know, these are tools and we it's how we choose to use it. But it's also how, what we choose to call money. So it, it's a question of having um me ways of exchanging goods and services and things that we do with, with each other in a way that doesn't involve um other organizations you know especially corporate organizations or whatever so it's it's really finding ways to um interact to um uh to, to do it sort of privately you know to be to do it within freedom i mean but that is you know further down the line what you can do locally possibly may be more possible but again it's it's for um people to take back control of you know the money creation system whatever whatever that looks like and to have many different ways and for it to be as decentralized as possible you know just to keep it away from some something that can then be you know some sort of central organization that can be then infiltrated taken over and um you know controlled and taken away and that's that's what's going on this sort of more and more centralized control happening which is why we should be doing the complete opposite and, and moving away from these things you know centralized systems um and there are plenty of creative people that are um developing all kinds of different ways of doing these different things so um yeah. you know which which is good you know as i say plenty of plenty of creative people i mean again you know like tech people say oh technology it, it has its uses you know let's let's use it for our benefit um but it's not to let it take over our lives and and it's, it's you know, got to, it's got to be it's got to be taken all of these things whether it's the legal system the banking system the health system have got to be taken out of the hands of the people that are just using it to exploit mm. humanity yeah and then they can be good things you know, and I've, I've just said we know what to do about the medical system. You know, people can take back control into their own lives. You know, it's, health is very simple. You know, take care of those four factors that we talked about and we, we explain fully in our book. And you can take control of your health. And if we can take control back of the banking system so it's run for the people, 
take back control of the legal system so that, you know, mm -hmm. because the whole legal system is illegal, uh, you know, judges and barristers, lawyers, uh, you know. But one quick way to start to change that is if people were taught the power of the jury person, because they're not taught that. They're not, they should be taught it at school, the power of the constitution, the real meaning of the constitution, but most of all, the power of the jury person, because they're not taught it at school and they're certainly not taught it for anyone who's had to sit on a jury. I, I've sat on several juries in my life and you're not told anything by the judge for obvious reasons, because he doesn't want to know that you are the most powerful person in the court, not him. He wants you to think it's him. But the jury can overturn anything. They are the final say as to whether someone is innocent or guilty, and they can overturn a law. So if they think that the law that that person has been brought to court is an unjust law, they can just find the person not guilty. Yeah. Even though technically they may have broken a law. But if mm. the jury thinks it's, as I say, an unjust law, they just find the person not guilty. Now, the judge may blow hot and cold, but there's nothing he can do hot, about it. Very hot. Because, mm. because the ju he can't override the jury's decision. So if everyone was taught that, and you imagine everyone going into the courts all over the world, knowing they were the most powerful person, and they... Their job not only is to judge the person, but to judge the law that has brought them to court. And they're judging both. Now, they're not told that they can do that, but they can and they should. That would that would change the legal system a lot just by that small little bit of education. Mm. OK. Yeah. Do, do you both read all the same books? Like when you when you buy a book, do you both? read them. I only ask you because I'd imagine writing an entire book with another person is like, it would be extremely difficult like putting that all together. So like, yeah. how do you do we, that? We, we research separately, but then come together, of course, to put it together in okay. some form. Um, I think a lot of the, well, a, a lot of the books we have both read, but we've also read some others sort of separately as well you know because it's just uh, but again you know having slightly different sort of or interest in slight certain different areas and um yeah i mean there's so much material to cover but yeah so it's um and then we bring it together you yeah. know um this is the only way really i mean there are a number of books of course in the world that are, that have two authors and uh they work the same way i guess you know you do the research. There's such a vast amount of material that we had to research and too much for one person. Yeah. Uh, but two people have it, of course. And then you bring elements of it together. I mean, we we would we often say to people we had to leave out, uh, even though our book is nearly 800 pages, uh, we had to leave out as much as we actually put in it because it, otherwise it would have been two or three volumes instead of one. What topics? Uh, sorry? Oh, well, probably more detail on um, a number of the okay. that are in okay. there. So we had to be more concise on, as I say, just in certain topics. Well, if we if we'd have gone more into the section on vested interests, for instance, mm. I mean that would have you could write a book on that just yeah. on that one topic. Yeah, and also you're saying about um, infectious diseases. I mean. Um, you know, we have been asked, oh, well, you don't, do you cover this? Do you cover that? I mean, there were a lot of other so-called infectious diseases that, that we didn't discuss. But I mean, there are hundreds, if not thousands of them. So it was impossible to cover all of them. We just tried to cover a selection. But I mean, we, we looked into more than we wrote about. We just made a selection that we thought would cover enough of the ground to, for people to get, you know, a good idea of how to look at these the other diseases for themselves, you know, and to sort of but maybe when, but, you know look for themselves to see what else could have been could have been the case. But once you've, as we did, discover that germs were not the cause of disease, then that really that's the end of it. Really it pulls the rug out of all it the pulls others. the rug out mm. from under everything. Mm. Once once you realise that the germ theory is a complete fallacy and has no scientific basis to it, then infectious diseases or anything that's supposedly caused by a germ 
you can dismiss it straight away and look for some other cause. And and so you don't need to cover and talk about every one of the thousands of so-called illnesses that uh, can befall mankind. Once you know, well, it's nothing to do with germs. So look at what it is that's made that person ill and start with looking at nutrition, are they eating and drinking properly? And what is their toxic exposure? You know, those yeah. would be the first two things I'd ask people to look at. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I actually want to talk. This is the last thing I want to talk about is uh, nutrition because it's what brought me into all this and uh, inspired me to, to dig deeper. Um, Everyone seems to have different philosophies about nutrition. I mean, you know, there there's the vegans, there's, and then on the complete other side of the spectrum, there's, there's carnivores. And um, to me, uh, eating local and organic, that's the number one thing. And that's what I've discovered to be most important, regardless of what diet you choose. Exactly. Um, Right. But, but I'm, I'm, I want to, cause you, your, your philosophy in the book was more of a plant-based approach. And you even said that humans naturally are not even um, meat eaters. May, I don't want to misrepresent you, but we don't, we, we didn't necessarily consume a lot of meat in a natural context. And so I'd, I'd like to hear a bit more about your thoughts on that. Okay. Well, obviously this can be quite a controversial uh, subject, um, and people often, I mean, you're quite right, both Dawn and I are plant-based and have been for many, many years. I've <clears throat> I've been not eating any meat, fish, poultry or anything for 50 years, you know, so, and I'm uh, still doing quite well. I'm 73, so uh, I've done okay not eating. So obviously it works, and then there are other people who, eat loads of meat, you know, and, and they're okay too. So, so long as you get the right balance of nutrition, I mean, there are obviously other reasons why people may or may not eat meat. Okay. But we won't go into that. But the thing is, the important thing is getting the correct nutrition because that's what the body needs to be able to look after itself, to repair itself, keep itself healthy and strong. And you can get the, the that nutrition from a variety of diets, you know, the stuff you eat and drink so long as i mean you did mention is to get it organic as much as possible whatever it is as local. clean as clean as local unprocessed uh, unprocessed unpoisoned yeah. yeah. chemicalized you know um you yeah. know if you can avoid the chemicals keep it clean keep it unprocessed you know you're you're well ahead of most people especially in well i mean in america you know with the standard american diet yeah and and the, these are the things, you know, you can't live on hamburgers and Coca-Cola. You know, you can't. Not it might, ta might taste very nice, but you can't live on that um, <laughs> much as people might try. You know, you need a greater variety of nutrition to keep the body healthy. And, uh, and it, it's relatively simple to do, you know, I mean, as well as growing your own. A lot of people have started to do that more and more and grow some, some at least of their own vegetables. So at least they know. Uh, where they've come from um so yeah it's relatively simple but just to be aware of what it is you eat and the water you drink you know i mean both dawn and i i mean i i use a reverse osmosis system to filter my water dawn uses a, a distiller so that at least we know that the water we drink is clean it's not got chloride and fluoride and all sorts of other contaminants in it so simple things but important things. And uh, if you take care of those things, you'll, you'll be healthy. It's as simple as that. And you won't have lots of illnesses. You won't have lots of severe detox systems because that's really what it is because your body won't have an excess of toxins to, uh, to get rid of it. I mean, your body's detoxing all the time and you don't even notice it because the amounts of toxins that may be entering it are relatively small. And yeah. so it can handle them. It's when those toxins build up because you've suppressed it by taking some over the counter medication or something, yeah. or, um, and you've mis been mistaken in what your body's trying to do. For instance, even the so-called common cold. I mean, that's a sure sign. If you have that of congestion, and you've got them because the body's had to employ the mucous membranes to try and get rid of excess toxicity because it's not been able to get rid of it through the normal methods of uh, sweating or excrement or urination. 
it's not been able to get rid of it. So then it employs the mucous membranes to help it out. And then people say, oh, I've caught a cold or I've got the flu. But they're detox methods of excess toxicity. But then, of course, they very often make the mistake of taking something to suppress those symptoms, uh, which just makes the matter worse because the yeah. body can't get rid of the toxins. But going back to um, eating as well, there is there is also uh, sort of in, increased um, the, the sort of pace of life, if you like. People just grab something, eat on the go, whatever, um, instead of sitting down and, and enjoying their food. And mm. um, it, it, there, there's a different approach to food and it, it's um, regarded as, you know, just something you need. To, yeah, you just have to kind of, you know, have something just for the energy so it doesn't matter what it is well it does matter what it is because you know your body responds better to um fresh you know clean organic food but at the same time there is still the the actual enjoyment of sitting with your food rather than you know always having something else going on you know um and so people don't sit around together and in, and enjoy a meal together you know have that pleasure from the food so that that's been lost as well and that that again kind of goes into what we said before about um you know your sort of beliefs and ideas but it's because of your because you're taking the food into your body it's how you approach that food and if you kind of are just oh well I just just need to put something in you're you're not necessarily giving it the right energy as it were uh, you know so there's there is that aspect of really enjoying what you're eating putting that the, well, the right feeling into it the right emotion you're taking energy on everything's energy isn't mm. it mm. in its basic form everything is energy and of course the food you eat you're is bringing energy. energy into your body so to have good food and a respect for the food um is important and to pay attention to it it's it's all about energy exchange in a way so that's all part of the process of eating it's all part of the process of nutrition to and to uh, give your body the right ingredients so it runs properly we often joke about you know if you if you bought a really good car something like a ferrari and then put really crap petrol and oil in it <laughs> and then wonder why it didn't run very well well yeah you know well, the body's the same. It's a finely tuned. Oh, it's much better. Than it, it's not a machine. Yeah, no, it's not but, it, but it's a finely it's tuned. Machine. It's a fantastic thing. But if you don't treat it right and you load it up with rubbish, eventually it's not going to work properly. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's very simple, really. <laughs> when you yeah. Think about it. Yeah. Yeah, it is simple. Um, when I started getting into nutrition, I kind of fell into the diet wars thing where it's they're basically fighting over macronutrient ratios instead of the actual quality of the food. And then I, I think I pretty much transcended that and got into way more important stuff. Like I, I made the choice to uh, eat my food without the presence of any technology around or with another person. And I would eat outside ideally or eat while grounded to the earth. So all those things like that you're mentioning, I mean, they're definitely so important and they're completely neglected by the diet wars that, that are being pushed like um they're definitely pushing diets and uh it doesn't doesn't seem to be the right approach so yeah I'm, I'm it's seeing... another divide and conquer mechanism so anything yeah. where it puts pits you against someone else i <laughs> yeah, i exactly. i would suggest kind of go okay they want us to fight so i'm not going to yeah. let's have a you know sensible let's have a discussion and, and we might agree to disagree that's fine but not to be, not allow ourselves to be, you know, the divide and conquer, because now is the time for not being divided because, yeah. you know, there are more of us than there are of them. And, um, you know, we have far more in common than we have differences really. So, uh, you know, that's, that's, you know, the way to approach things and to, to move things in the right direction as, as yeah, that's well, how I see it. To all work with one another rather than against one yeah, another. Yeah, cooperation. It's a, it's a basic, simple principle. Because, as Dawn has said, it's also a basic, simple principle of divide and conquer, which has been used very effectively for thousands of years. Yeah. And they're using it now more and more. So we have to realize that and not allow ourselves to be yeah. divided and conquered. Mm, it's right. to Definitely. come together in a peaceful way, no violence required, but to be, you know, not to comply with unjust things 
you know, unjust laws, unjust regulations, you know, not to comply with them, just to, you know, come together and do what's right, you know, and we all know what that is. So uh, very, very simple. Great. This has been amazing. Um, Don and David, I really appreciate you both for taking the time. I will put the link to your book in the description it's 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 probably the best book i've ever read i mean it's it's so comprehensive yeah, yeah it's Thank you. um Thank you. yeah it, it's excellent and it for for the, the average person who hasn't been exposed to this stuff like it, it this is this is the book that that changes your life because it changes the way you view the world completely it's it's, it's a totally different um view of the world that you have after getting this understanding and yeah i can definitely attest to that so thank you for the work that you've done and um it's been great talking to you Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you very Thank you. much.